Welcome back to the North Tonawanda Football Hall of Fame YouTube channel. I'm Ed Halinski. Got another great guest with us here today. Uh, another author. This one from 100 Years of Dynamite, a story of TNT football, the one and the only Eugene Fold. There we go. Eugene, how are you doing these days? I'm fine, Mr. Halinski. Nice to talk to you. I'm very honored to be able to do this. This is something that I've spent a great number of years being involved with. You're you're a rather interesting person because of your connection to the Tonawanda program and being from Tonawanda. Uh, plus your book that you know came out in 2009 and uh, 300 pages of uh, chronicling uh, 100 years of uh, a wonderful uh, rivalry between these two high schools. Yes, I got interested in this in 2008 when John or Jerry Sullivan was still working for the Buffalo News. And that was the 50th anniversary of the Courier Express and then the Buffalo News picking an all-Western New York football team. And in honor of the 50th anniversary, they picked an all-time all-Western New York team. And two out of the three backfield members on the first team, where do you think they were from? Probably North Tonawanda. One was probably John Chisera. That's correct. And the quarterback was Rick Casada from Tonawanda. And I just thought to myself, I go, man, there has been a lot of great athletes that have played this sport in the Twin Cities. And I basically started investigating it. And then I found out that in 09, that was going to be the 100th game. So I really worked hard that entire year to try to put this together, I thought it was a solid effort. I've got some errors in there, but it was a solid first effort. I'd never written a book before, and I did it in about nine months. What were some of the challenges that you came across in, in, in putting this book together? Well, I know now what I didn't know then in terms of being able to get pictures off of FultonHistory.com which without that Tom Trininski newspaper repository from Fulton, New York, I wouldn't have been able to do this because I was living in Fort Myers, Florida at the time. And so I did the best I could with scanning pictures into the computer and then trying to save them into my flash driver, into my computer. And I know how to do those things a lot better now. I know how to take snapshots and put them into the document directly and avoiding the scanning step. Because a lot of times when you're scanning, the pictures pixelate. After you finally print something out, they get, it looks like a checkerboard over everyone's face or all over the image. And that's happened in a lot of these other books that I've written in the other years since on the greatest athletes in Tonawanda High School history. Looking back at that book right now, what surprised you that you came across? I know they started in 1896, but didn't resume it until uh, 1904. Why the gap, and, and what surprised you in, in, uh, in doing your research? Well, Dr. Dan Bellinger was the only male student at Tonawanda High School in 1896. I believe he played for North Tonawanda, actually. So they didn't have any students. And then what happened in the early, very early 19 aughts is that the students were calling themselves, they just organized themselves. And that's reflective of what was going on in college football at the same time. They were organizing themselves and getting games against other areas or against other schools. And some of the authorities, some of the school administrators started becoming concerned. And that's the same thing that happened with college football. The faculty started to take over the organization and took it away from the students so that it's more organized and more perhaps safer than it would have been otherwise. That's how the NCAA was founded, Ed, for the same reasons. Okay. The game was considered to be an unsafe sport, so they tried to refine it and outlaw certain types of plays. Reading your, reading your book and, 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 here, and there were a few things that struck me. Um, 
when George Vetter came in in 1938, is it true that he changed the, the high school nickname to the Lumberjacks at that point? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. I, didn't, I don't remember coming across that. Originally, they're the red and blue. That was the nickname of the school. And Tonawanda was the red and white. And red was not available as a color during World War II. This is according to Hap Holloway. Have you interviewed him, Ed? Haven't, haven't had the pleasure with Hap Holloway. Well, he's probably a, even more tech challenged than I am. And he's worth it. He's 89 years old. He's still around and he's still sharp. So if someone could set that up for you, you'd love to talk to him. And uh, he said I'd, that love the to, color, I'd love to talk to him and I'd love to talk uh, to him. Uh, the Bob Adams as well. Repository of so much information for decades and decades. He graduated from Tonawanda in 1951. And he's still going. He's the oldest living member of the Eldridge Bicycle Club. But anyways, he told me this story many years ago that the color red was not available during World War II. And that's when they started using maroon. And that's why they and they kept using that color in Tonawanda ever after that. But they still kept the red as part of the warriors, red warriors. That brings me to the point. When did they uh, Tonawanda become the warriors? In the post-World War II era. Not too long after they took a vote in the school and that nickname won out. There was some talk, but because North Tonawanda had already co-opted the lumberjacks, there's articles in the late 30s, Ed, that they're referring to both Tonawanda and North Tonawanda as the lumbermen or as the lumberjacks, because both areas were involved in that industry. But North Tonawanda got there first, so they kept that nickname, and then the students wanted to use the warriors. Interesting. Right after World War II. A lot of things, a lot of things changed or whatever else. Are you surprised that this rivalry still continues? Yes and no. Uh, yes, because the modern generation has not been educated by people of war, which we were. They either served in World War II and then be on the GI Bill, they went and got their educations and they became educators. And they had those militaristic values, which are kind of on the out now. It's not really too politically correct to teach aggressive behavior. And that's just fundamental to the sport of football. You got to be an aggressive guy. And now you kind of get called on the carpet for that, either through your physical behavior or your verbal comments to people. But no, I'm not surprised because this is still a traditional area and there's still enough people around who understand the significance of the game. And I think that there's still enough kids around, enough students around that appreciate the fact that they're actually connecting with something that's been going on for well over 100 years now. And I think that's a good thing. And that's why it should continue, even though North Tonawanda dominates until Jason Frazier got the ball a few years ago, I see his father was a good player. And when he played in the early 90s, Jason Sr.'s team, that's who they couldn't beat. They couldn't beat NT. And they had very good teams with Mark Prowitz and Andy Bensick and Ken Dewey was quarterback and Tim Kenny Jr. was a junior quarterback on that team. They had an outstanding offensive line. And they were two points away from being undefeated going into the 1992 TNT game. They lost the wheat field by a point and Grand Island by a point. But they they could never come close to NT. They, that game wasn't close. I think it was 28 to 7 was the final. You grew up in, in Tonawanda. Uh, yes, what, on what, William what, Street. What was the feeling uh, coming up on TNT week when you're, the, the boys were going to take on uh, North Tonawanda? And were they hopeful or... or? What was, what was the feeling and the attitude of the community back then? In the 70s, it was not a real lopsided rivalry yet. That is the demarcation point for North Tonawanda beginning to dominate the series. 
because of that long winning streak. 1978 was the only game that Tonawanda won. But in no way, shape, or form did we go into those games expecting to get killed at all. And that's some of my earliest memories of life, Ed. There's an alley behind my house where I grew up because Foles Brothers Incorporated was my family's business. It was a beer distributorship. And that's where the warehouse was located. And when I was a kid, I used to see those lights go on in Clint Small Stadium. And I go running in the house and I go, Dad, what's all those lights in the background back behind the woods on Broughton Street? He goes, oh, Tonawanda High School's playing tonight, Gene. I go, playing what? They're playing football. That's a big tradition in this city. So we, and I watched those games in the early 70s and late 60s. 1969 was the first time I went to a game. And that's the last time Tonawanda won until my junior year of high school in 78. And there was some very close games in between. And there's a few blowouts, 70 and 71. 24 nothing in 70 with the great Don Garrett. There was a tremendous athlete from North Tonawanda, football, swimming, and track. He scored a couple touchdowns, and they made three two-point conversions. Pat Campbell was the quarterback for NT. They were both three-year players for the Lumberjacks. That game was not close, and that's the worst weather that I ever saw for a TNT game. My dad took me home at halftime because we were soaked to the bone. The field was just a, a quagmire. You couldn't even see the players' uniforms or nothing. And that's some of the statistics that I'm missing from my Tonawanda research. I don't have anything from that game because I don't think they could keep track of anything that was going on. It was terrible. And then the next year, you probably remember that game. That's Keith Pasucci's senior year, and they walloped Tonawanda at Vetter Stadium. That's 47-7. And Tonawanda scored first. <laughs> it was all NT after that. Ken Scripp, he was a great player for the Jacks back in those days. Bob Schwingler was one of their quarterbacks. They had an excellent team. And when that's the first year that Chuck Ramsey coached. When you were doing the research for your book, did you find yourself getting, especially with the Tonawanda players, um, getting some sort of connection with them? I mean, I found it the same way going, getting all through these films or whatever, seeing all these all these players, whether they're with us anymore or they passed on, that it's quite the memory and quite the, you're sucked in with the, the connection of it. It's kind of it's definitely a bonding issue, right? Because there are some people were a generation older than me or 10, 15 years older and never really had any sort of friendships with them. But through this process, this is how you can do that. And that's why oral history is real important. And what you guys are doing here is tremendous. Tommy Small is gone now. Right. I and mean, you got a record of what he felt about this game and everything that was going on in his high school years. That's just invaluable. It really is. And that's what, when I did this Kenmore East and Kenmore West book, that's how I got to know a lot of these guys. And that was a great rivalry in the 70s. East-West game was really good. Very good rivalry. Kemmel East was a power in the early 70s under Sparky Adams. Got to ask you a question about Tonawanda and their, their football athletes. In your estimation, who was the greatest uh, Tonawanda football player? In the old days, it was a man named Carl Sentz, S-E-N-T-Z. He, his parents were, they had a shop and they were tailors. And then there was talk in the early 20s that he was going to go play for the University of Michigan under Fielding Yost. Hurry up, Yost. Great college football coach. But nothing ever became of that. But Carl Sentz stayed around the Twin Cities. He was an insurance guy. You know where the Crown Agency used to be? Sure. Right over the, the Crick Bridge. His office was located over there for a long time. And that's and that became Crown Agency, his business, if I'm not mistaken. And then after that, there's Robert Rose and Ben Kish. Ben Kish played for the Philadelphia Eagles and the Brooklyn football Dodgers in the 40s. Eight years he played. He played on two NFL championship teams. 
and the 47 team lost in the snow bowl or actually that was the ice bowl they played the chicago cardinals they lost to the cardinals but then the next two years they won and then in the 50s there's a man named ed bowers who played for syracuse university when they were national champions in 1959 and he played defense for them he saw a lot of snaps because he was a fifth year senior He's the last cut of the original Buffalo Bills team in 1960. He almost made pro football. And then, of course, we all know Rick Casada's exploits. In the more modern times, he's been the most prolific Tonawanda football player. And I can go on if you like. <laughs> go, go right ahead. The, uh, the, the that's, to me, great. that's that's the fairest way to do it because you can't just say one guy was the greatest because the game was different back in the 20s and 30s. The punt was a weapon. Uh, North Tonawana coaches, Vetter himself was an advocate of quick kicking and changing the field position. So that's a different game. Passing was not emphasized whatsoever. So a guy like Kish, he played both ways, and he punted. You know, he's a triple threat guy. Then in the 70s, I think probably the best player is my old buddy, Ricky Mislin. He was a tremendous player for his size, and Johnny DiBiase earlier in the 70s, they were very good players. And Dave Lasky, who played for Canisius College, he was a three-year starter for Tonawanda in the mid-70s. He was one of my heroes. Because he had long blonde hair, and it's coming out the bottom of his helmet. And he wore glasses like I did, and he wore white shoes. And I wanted to be just like that guy. You kidding? He's the first guy I ever saw dunk a basketball in the Tonawanda gym. He was a good basketball player, too. And then in the 80s, there's Kenny Hoyer, a recent inductee into the Tonawanda Wall of Fame. He was an all-Western New York quarterback, lefty. And he went on and played at the University of Buffalo. He's still in their record books for passing in many categories. And Rick Postula, who was all division, both offense and defense. He played from 82, 83, and 84. Mike Kramer was a lefty quarterback back then. He's in Tonawanda's Wall of Fame. Great passer, great baseball player. Kramer played baseball at Marietta. 1988, Marietta was the Division three national champions. And Mike was a prominent part of that pitching staff. And in the 90s, Joe Kismerski, tremendous running back. He's the all-time leading rusher. And he's not in the Wall of Fame, and that's an injustice because it's not even close. He's got over 4,000 yards rushing in his three years playing on Tonawanda's varsity, and he really needs to be inducted. But he got in a lot of trouble, and there's a lot of animosity there. And I'm not sure if he ever even actually graduated or not. So that's something that's keeping him out, I think. In the more modern times, I really lost track of it after I moved to Florida. And now there's no Tonawanda news anymore, so now I'm completely in the dark. I was going to ask you, since 2009, have you been updating the – the rivalry. I have some of it documented, not the recent games at all. Since 2016, nothing really. Will you come up with a, a revised edition for 125 years of? Uh, hey, yeah, of yeah, there you go. That's what I was thinking exactly, Mr. Helensky. 125 is a nice number. I would, I definitely consider. It. And I've also gone back and gone over a lot of games. I've redone quite a few of them in my some of these other things that I've been working on. I have a history of Tonawanda from 1960 through 74. Every game has been documented. And I redid all of those TNT games. Again, because I have better pictures now. Those have all been done. All of the 1950s games have been redone. You lived in the era when Clint Small was still coaching. Um, I can remember that, yes. What and in doing your research about Coach Small as well, too, what can you talk about? What can you say about the man? 
I've only come across one individual that did not like Clint Small. I'm serious. He's been praised and beloved by many people because he was a gentleman. Those 63, 62 teams that he had, they could have scored 60 points on people. But he pulled the starters out and he let other people play. He was well known for that, whereas some of the other NFL coaches took a different tack, especially later in the decade. I won't name any names, but 1969 comes to mind. What are your thoughts about the Niagara Frontier League, the old NFL? Was it the, be was it the best uh, uh, league in, in New York State? Many people said that. And there's a, many people that came out of that league that played major college football. North Tonawanda ran the single wing predominantly. And in the early 50s, the Tennessee Volunteers under General Nyland, Bob Nyland, I don't know if you're familiar with him, he was a single wing advocate. And he recruited a lot of guys from North Tonawanda because Vetter loved that offense. They already knew how to run it when they got to the university. The Urbano brothers, right. uh, Ronnie Gust, I think his nickname was Redhead. Jim, uh, Jim Butel. Bob Urbano was the captain of Tennessee in 1956, and they went to a major bowl game. That's when Johnny Majors was Tennessee's big running back. Johnny Majors went on and became a famous college football coach. Right. And he was highly – he got a lot of votes in the Heisman voting in that year, 56 won by Paul Horning from Notre Dame, which I believe Horning's the only guy that won the Heisman from a losing team. If you had to do it all, all over again with, with your book, what would you change? Did you have any regrets doing that, doing that book? I did it too quickly, and I didn't really proofread enough to make sure that I had all my facts straight because I have some errors in there. But other than that, it was a pretty solid first effort because I had never tried to write anything before at all. And maybe I should have slowed down a little bit and not really worried about having it come out before the game. Because when I met with Mr. Dunnigan, who you've also interviewed on right. here, Jim Dunnigan, I went to his office. He was still the vice principal of Ken Maurice High School at the time. And I had a rough draft developed about the East-West rivalry game, which was their 50th anniversary was the same year as the 100th game for TNT. So I was one year after it when they had their big celebration of everything. And I went to his office and I showed him my paper draft. And I go, I know it's already passed, but do you think it's worth doing this? And he just looks me in the eye and he goes, absolutely. And they were just a great help to me. Jim McNally, I got involved with the Mouse Pack. Those guys, they, they were all helpful and they all purchased the book. I only have five copies left. <laughs> that, that, those are not laying around. They're all gone. I was going to say, why you haven't reprinted and... and and use Amazon as a way to distribute. That's an idea. All right. Well, you can, I've got you can a send me that royalty check, you know, anytime <laughs> for the idea. You realize that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no sweat. So what else has been going on? Are you still in Auburn, Ed? I, I still am. i um, been here since uh, we're in our starter home that we bought in 1987. And, uh, Nothing's changed really, except uh, I, I do my thing you know, a little bit for the radio group, and I broadcast high school athletics on uh, WAUB, and and we stream it online. So we have a little bit of fun with that. So life is good with that, and getting involved in this project in the last two plus years, we just passed a hundred thousand uh, views on our YouTube channel. So life wow. is good. We're over eight hundred videos between the, you know, digitizing all those games and saving memories. I would love to do put more of the Tonawanda games up there from the Clint Small collection. However, I've been told that uh, people wouldn't watch it, which I find uh, to be a, not a correct statement by any way, shape, or form. But uh, it's the powers that be in the city of Tonawanda that tell me otherwise. Looking at Clint Small's videos, though, uh, were tremendous because different, different coaches had different ways of, of filming games. And, and Clint took a, a, an approach that he wanted um, 
locker room reaction with his players. There, there's there's videos of the, his players yeah. with victory cigars after a TNT game. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't happen very often, but they had the victory cigars. And you hear the stories when they would come back on the bus, you know, after winning the TNT game. And they passed stopped by, at Eddie's. It, right. And, 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 on Main Street. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and <laughs> bottles of beer were passed to the to the players through the windows, I mean, at, at, at that point. So, I mean. It's a different world. It, it, it's a different world and a different thing happening with that. Um Tell people what you're doing with yourself these days. I know you're you're not living in Western New York full time, and I believe you were you were a you were an instructor overseas. Yes, I was, and that's that job is now ended. I resigned. Uh, they wanted me to do some things that I didn't want to do. I don't want to go back in the classroom anymore. I had all my classes were online and they were working very well, but. They said that I needed to come back and do some classes face to face. And I didn't really want to do that anymore because it was working too well the way it was. So I'm going to move back out to Las Vegas here after my birthday in September. I haven't had a birthday around here since 2003 before I moved to Fort Myers, Florida in 2004. So I'm hanging out and I want to see some of the Bills madness, too. The team is going to do it. You got to believe. What other projects are you working on? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I have the Tonawanda football history from 1960 to 1974. That's a very good rough draft. There's not much left to do on that. I have written a history of Syracuse University football from 1956 through 1967. I already had the Ed Bowers years done in the late 50s. And I had the Casada years done from 65 through 67. So I go, why not just do the years in between? Because they had a lot of very good teams in the that's the golden years of Ed or uh, Ben Schwartzwalder's reign as right. Syracuse coach. So that's in the works. That's roughed out. I'm hoping to go to Syracuse here in the next week or two and try to finish it. And I've also written a history on University of Buffalo football from 1955 through 1965, the Dick Offenheimer years. Offenheimer coached Kenmore. When that was the big game, was North Tonawanda and Kenmore in the 40s. As you'll recall, one right. of, two of those games were moved to Civic Stadium, I believe, in Buffalo. Right. And the one game had 21,000 people at it for a high school football game. Well, Kenmore, and, knocked off, Kenmore knocked off NT in that game. That's the John Witowski years for the Lumberjacks. TNT games would draw thousands of people as well, too. A lot at better. Clint Small over on Main Street, that was more of a bandbox, but still they could pack them in. And you could also view the game from up on the railroad tracks, too. So And throw, <laughs> and throw, and throw uh, items at players as well, too, from the railroad track, which has had, <laughs> happened over the years as well. Yeah. Possibly. A couple, we have a couple of minutes left. What would you like to talk about the, the, the TNT rivalry that we, I haven't brought up yet? The streaker. Which one? We had one in 77 and one in 79. 79 when I was in the locker room, so I didn't get to see that near riot that broke out. And one of our notorious classmates from those years, Sophie Shavat, who was a beautiful young lady, but she was a tomboy. And they got mad at the police hassling. They, they caught that guy. Right. And it, it was, there was a lot of arrests. We found out after the game. And my colleagues sitting across from here now were at his son's house. His sister was one of the people that was arrested. Right, Kenny? I can't remember that. Melissa, yeah. Her name was in the police beat, dude. <laughs> <laughs> but then the, the 77 one was the classic. The guy went right through the van. And they were waiting for him at the fence. And they flipped him over the fence. He was gone. Well, I, and I know who the gentleman is. He he won't come on camera with me yet, but uh, <laughs> we, we've had conversations on that because I, I would love to to do it um, with him. Uh, but he's 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 hold, sticking to his guns, and I I have to admire that and appreciate that. So when the time is right and he wants to be identified, will be. I mean, it could be, you know, before we know it, it could be in twenty twenty seven. Be you know, uh, to mark a, a milestone for something like that, but. 
Yes, the gentleman, uh, the 1979 uh, streaker, I was in contact with him as well, too. And uh, he was banned from all high school af- uh, activities uh, throughout the rest of his high school career. He had to do community service. Um, wow. It was uh, it was a big deal. I mean, they really treated him as a as a real bad criminal, you know, mm-hmm. except for a guy in taking his clothes off and trying to do the hundred yard dash, you know. That was streaking was a thing in the seventies, man. It was a popular college campus activity. Buffalo State they did that stuff up there all the time. And the other thing, really, that I I missed that used to really tingle my spine was hearing the high school bands play. Hearing them play the fight songs, and that's the thing. It seems to be a thing of the past now, unfortunately. I re- that was like it helped create the atmosphere, a football atmosphere. Hearing them bands play, hearing the Tonawanda fight song being played, I could hear that at my house when I was very little. And I, I man, that's I want to be a part of that. Well, the weather was changed as well too, because of, uh, most of those TNT games were played in November, at, and yeah. now the games are played in in late October. Yeah, that's made a difference. That has made a difference. Eugene Foles, I want to thank you so much for joining me, for having this wonderful conversation. Good to catch up with you. The last time was uh, 2009 at the Third Waters Club when you asked, yeah. me, so- when you asked me something that I wrote 35 years beforehand. So, um, and- I actually found that out, that those games that took place before 1896, are, they, they played another game. A second one that was the second team that was playing. Oh, it wasn't, okay. It wasn't the varsity. Well, then we go back to 2021 here, just a, a year ago, where they played in, in March and then they played in October because of COVID. So uh-huh. you had these quirky things that do happen from time to time. So Definitely. I wish you well, my friend. Wish you thanks well. for having me. You're, you're I really welcome. appreciate it. I'm very honored for you to ask me to no, do No, I mean, you're, you're, you're a plethora of information and, and doing this and going through all. A hundred games, and that takes a lot, and especially trying to go through, uh, whether it be microfiche or, or going to uh, the website FultonHistory.com. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of uh, a lot of time to go through that. So I wish you well, and thank you so much for joining me. All right, thanks, you Ed. Good day.